So as, we, as Pastor mentioned, we're going to be speaking tonight, or discussing tonight, sanctification, and how this too is by grace, just as justification, salvation is as gra by grace. Change is our topic, is really the idea of sanctification. <laughs> I went to make sure all these were uh, balanced, and now they're not, but so it could be an adventurous evening. Um, <laughs> But change, it's something that we all want, it's something that we all need, it's, but something that when we admit it, we really don't like it. We don't really resist change, but we resist being changed. Because being changed is risky. In fact, if we are being changed, we don't know for sure what that outcome might be. We don't know for sure what the final end result might be. If we reject change, though, we can become stagnant and we can become architects of decay, and that too is risky. And so we're kind of stuck, kind of a bummer of a situation. We want change, we, we need change, but we resist being changed. And as we, we resist over time, we can get stale. But there's good news. The good news is that God is a changer, though this brings about some conflict, like we said, because we naturally resist being changed. But here too, God has the solution. And the solution is what we would call the story of his changing us. This is called sanctification. So as you see on your notes, we'll have a purpose here tonight. We would like to study God's sanctification process, see how it's based on proper spiritual identity, position, and power source. And then we will see that sanctification, like justification, is by grace through faith and not by works. And then we'll finish by focusing on two practical passages to take to heart and to take home for application. We're going to cover tonight a little some of what Dave had already covered this afternoon. It's going to be also covering some of what we covered during the pastor's conference, but hopefully we learn through repetition as well. So if we're going to su successfully study sanctification, and the sanctification process, then it would be good to start to have a real quick and basic understanding of what sanctification is. So sanctification is the theological term describing how God affects change within us. It has a basic meaning of being set apart. And the idea then is that we will be set apart to God, and then we are going to be set apart from sin. God would like us to be set apart unto him as his as he puts a mark on us, as we saw also earlier this morning. And he wants to set us apart from sin in our life and not being dominated by it. It is seen in three stages. There is positional sanctification, practical sanctification, and perfect sanctification. As we think of positional sanctification, this would be referring to salvation. So we would say this is what, where this occurs, right? here at conversion. This is where you are set apart as you are put in Christ, where you are a child of God now with his marking and his name upon you. And all believers are positionally set apart and sanctified. Then we would have the practical sanctification, which is during our Christian life. And that's this time right here, where there's a practical sanctification. And then we would have perfect or ultimate sanctification, which takes place when we go home to be with the Lord, where we will be forever successfully set apart from all sin, successfully uh, serving as unto the Lord, set apart to him. And so when we think of sanctification, it's usually during this middle part, this practical part that we tend to focus on, and that's where God wants to bring about change in your life, change during the process of life. And God will bring about these changes his way on his terms because he's in control and he is God. And so you and I, we learn to allow him to do this. But when we allow this change, it's risky because we don't know for sure what the end of the road will bring. We don't know for sure where this is leading. He has areas that he wants to address. He has a chiseling hand in our life. His timetable might be different. His abilities certainly are different. And it's a bit scary. So are we sure we want to do this? Are we sure we want to allow the Lord free will to change us? So we often, 
We want to just play it safe, don't we? And we'll just get in the driver's seat. It's a little more comfortable that way, a safer approach. At least we have some idea where we're going. But encourage, hopefully we can see it's worth it to just relax by faith and let him lead. Change is risky, but God knows what he is doing. Now, J.B. Hickson could really attest to this. I don't even think he's here, so this is even better. <laughs> you might know his daughter, Bethany. Is, uh, J.B.'s daughter has been living here in Duluth for some time, and she's been a part of our church family here. We've enjoyed having her here with us, and I thought that it would be good to send J.B. a note about how she's been an encouragement, and I did. A few months ago, I sent a note, just a quick note to tell you, J.B., how encouraged I am with your daughter, Bethany. It's been a blessing to have her here in Minnesota, to see her blossom and grow spiritually as she has. It's rare to see such incredible spiritual change, and even more rare to be able to chronicle it on film, as I have managed to do. <laughs> and attached are three photos displaying her spiritual progress and maturity. So here are the photos. See, there's the first one. <laughs> And here we see some progression, and now we see her maturity. <laughs> That's good change, isn't it? <laughs> but as we think of, of any kind of change in a life, we want to also note that there is a cause of law and effect. That's going to drive me crazy all night. <laughs> There's a cause and effect process. This is really, really one of the laws of logic, that there's a cause and effect. Some, wherever we see something that has an effect, something caused that effect. There's a relationship between the first event, the cause, and the second event, the effect. And what we're looking for then, as we think of with God, is what is the first cause? What is it that triggers the event of your change, triggers this sanctification, so that God can freely change us? And I'm going to suggest to you there's two causes. The first would be the love of Christ, and the second is the grace of God. The love of Christ and the grace of God. First, we'll look at the love of Christ. And a primary verse that brings this out for us is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where we read, The love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all have died. The love of Christ compels us. What is this referring to? What is this love of Christ? It's a, actually understood to be a subjective genitive, which means it's referring to Christ's love for us, not our love for him. So first we note it's Christ's love for us, which means this is Christ's love that is demonstrated toward us. The love of Christ is the love that Christ has demonstrated for us. If you turn in your Bibles, we're in Romans 5. We've already are there. Notice this great passage in verse 6 of Romans 5 that says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now this is amazing because in this passage you'll see how we're described. In this passage, we're described as sinners. We are sinners. We see in verse 6 that we are said to be ungodly. And even if we had read further, we would see in verse um, 10, we are enemies. So we are not in good standing here with the Lord if he recognizes us to be sinners and ungodly and enemies. And yet, when did Christ die for us? In verse 6, the time word is the second word, when we were still without strength. At that time, when we're really at our worst and our ungodliness, it is then we see the magnitude that Christ died for us. Clearly, we're, we are undeserving. And then as the verse, six, uh, verse 8 ends, it says Christ died for us. It gives us the purpose statement. Why did Jesus Christ die? There's a reason for it. He died for you and I, on behalf of, as a substitute. You see, Jesus Christ was willing to do this, as we see in verse 8, a demonstration of God's love. And so, <clears throat> though we are not worthy, and though we are sinful, and though we can be rebellious at heart and inconsistent at best in our life, the Lord loved us and poured out his own soul 
on our behalf, as Isaiah 53 says. He went to a cross and he suffered death, a death he did not deserve, a death that we deserved, and he died for us as a substitute, taking upon himself the punishment for our sins. And in fact, the result goes on in verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. As we respond to this Savior who loved us by faith, as we'll see, two things were, we, see, we see in verse 9, we see then we have been justified by his blood, by his work, by his effort, and we will be saved from a future physical wrath through him. That's good news. And we see how this occurs right here in Romans 5 going backwards to verse 1. Paul says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God, a face-to-face -face peace. We can look to one another, look face-to-face. -face. And that means we are not at a state of being enemies. There is no more hostility. There's a reconciliation. And how did this occur? By faith. Faith in what? Faith in Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us. And so we have peace. As we go on in verse 2, though, whom also we have, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have access by faith into this grace, and we stand in grace, undeserved favor. And this brings about a hope, and a hope that then provides for us in verse 5. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which was given us. So we can identify with love. The Holy Spirit can teach us and show us even further this love. And hope is enhanced by the love of God poured out into us. So we, we can see then, are greatly loved by Christ. The love of Christ is a supernatural love, falling on an undeserved vessel such as you and I, and sacrificially giving and providing for in such a way that it has eternal value. This is a great love. And what does this love do then as we continue uh, in our think in the back in uh, 2 Corinthians? This love provides the very impulse for activity. This love then is the cause bringing the effect of our salvation. Because as we saw in 2 Corinthians 5.14, it's the love of Christ that compels us. It's the love of Christ that impels us or in a sense motivates us. It is a providing According to, to BDAG, a dictionary, it provides an impulse for some activity. The love of Christ is the cause, bringing the effect of your sanctification. And therefore, by implication, it requires a response from you and I. And with this response, with a response, then you can see this is the cause. The response is the effect of, uh, of, of a yieldedness to the Lord. The cause is the love of Christ, shown on the cross of Calvary, where he gave his life for you. And now this unrelenting love grips you and overwhelms you and humbles you. In fact, this is the love that stirs up a cause to action as we respond. And so being overwhelmed by his love, we can earnestly reply, as 1 John 5, 19 would remind us, we love him because he first loved us. And so this is all part of God's attribute, love of his grace. And so that would bring us, as we think of love and grace so much fitting together, it's the love of Christ that compels us, but also we see, number two, it's the grace of God that makes this difference. The grace of God is seen in Titus 2, 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. We are looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. We see here the grace of God that has brings salvation has appeared to all men. Has appeared is the first... Oops, sorry. You'll figure out why he's there in a minute. <laughs> The word appeared means a sudden burst of light. It's from the Greek word where we get our English word epiphany. So the grace of God has burst onto the scene and has burst onto the human element, which is 
nothing less than the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Here it's referring to Jesus Christ who has appeared on the horizon of humanity, who came to be the Savior to all men. And so Christ has appeared. And that salvation has been offered through the love of Christ on the cross of Calvary as this incarnate God in the flesh had lived a life that ended on a cross as a payment for sin. Nelson Mandela once said, education is the most powerful weapon you can use for change. And that's very true, isn't it? Our society puts a premium on education, and so do you and I, many of us do. Here's the ultimate education we're going to see now. The best education you can have, and it's free, because that same grace, secondly, is what? Teaching. And so we see there is a teaching ministry. Grace teaches. Grace is an educator. And what is it that grace is teaching? Grace is teaching, as we see in the verse, that we should be denying ungodliness and worldly lusts and living soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. That is sanctification. Grace is teaching and bringing about how we can change how we face life, how we value life, the things that we would, would look for and so forth. A daily walk. In fact, we need this change, don't we? And the grace even teaches us what to focus on as we see we're to be looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice another incidence of the word appearing here. But what are we looking for? Grace is teaching us how to look for it. The blessed hope. What is that referring to? The rapture, as we've heard uh, some of this week. The rapture where Jesus returns for his church, those who are saved, and brings them back where he is building a home for them. The rapture where we will be with the Lord forever as he will come for us, John 14, 3. And so grace is teaching us the value of understanding the eschatological uh, uh, place of the rapture and of future events. Grace is teaching this in our life. It's like a dog when you have him in your car and you go to the store. And the dog just waits, doesn't it? And the dog waits for you to return. And often will not look at hardly anything else and is anticipating and waiting. And that's what grace wants to teach you and I, to be fixed on Jesus Christ, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and waiting for that glorious appearing, seeing the value of that. And then responding. Grace will teach this to us. Grace brings this back. And so again, we see a first cause. Why? What is it about Jesus Christ? Grace. Notice he gave himself for us. That's a motivator. He did this. He gave his life. This is referring to the cross. And so properly again, understanding Christ and his cross work is essential. This is the first cause that brings about and affects the change in your life. And notice what it leads to. It leads to a peculiar people zealous down here for good works. That is a changed life. We're to be a bunch of weirdos here tonight. Peculiar, zealous for things that Christ values. Now, who directly benefits from all of this teaching? And notice, who's the, who is it that grace is teaching? It's teaching us. Notice it appeared to all men, which is universal, but now the focus shifts not from all men, but to us. And us is who? It is those who have responded to the salvation that has appeared to all men. The us is the believer in Christ. So if you're saved here tonight, grace is seeking to be a teacher and teaching you and I. We connect the us in Titus 2.12 now with Romans chapter 5, where you turn. Just look to Romans chapter 5, verse 17. We see that grace is wanting to teach us. In Romans 5.17, we see, If by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Notice we have one man who has an offense, we have another man who receives abundance of grace. Those who receive abundance of grace in Christ. That is to be, again, that is you and I. So grace is teaching us the ones who have received an abundance of grace. That's something that would describe as, a, as, a, as an adjective phrase for every one of us tonight. We've received abundance of grace. 
we now find ourselves, as we get to Romans 5, and what we consider a very significant sanctification passage of the New Testament that begins here in Romans 5 and continues on through half or most of Romans chapter 8. This passage in Romans 5 going into chapter 8 is the lengthiest treatment in the Bible of the subject. And as we read Romans 5, 17, we see then that there is an abundance of grace and there is a life that is given. So before we go on, let me just ask you this. We're going to go on now, but are you in this circled category of us? Is that you? Have you ever responded by faith to Jesus Christ and received this abundance of grace called forgiveness of sin and eternal life all coming to you because of what Christ has done is he demonstrated his love at Calvary, paying for the sins that you and I have committed and thereby providing an, a gift of eternal life. And when you respond to that by faith, then you can say that you know you're saved and you have, have eternal life. But if you don't know that you're saved, if you've never trusted in Christ, I would encourage you to do so now as he has loved you and has proved it and he has taken your debt. And as Romans 5.1 had mentioned, you can be justified by faith, and you can choose to believe on him, on Jesus Christ. So that's who the us is, and that's what it's about. You're a student. And so as Grace is teaching, let's hope that that's all of, us, all of us are now students in Grace's classroom. We've seen what sanctification is then. It's God making changes in our practical life. God wanting to set us apart increasingly onto him. We've seen why you and I would ever even let him do this. Why would you ever let him have his way? Because of the love of Christ that was demonstrated and shown. We have a reason now to find ourselves yielded to him. And now we've arrived at our sanctification passage here in Romans 5, where we see how God is going to accomplish this change in your life. The practical truths that we need to wrap our head around are in this, in this passage. We're going to see tonight. We're going to see that we're going to focus on sanctification principles that are set forth in this passage. Principles of identity in Romans 5, principles of position in Romans 6, principles of power in Romans 7 through 8. Yeah, we're going to get through all that. Because <laughs> we're not going to, we're going to go quickly and not in, in, the, in, in the greatest of detail. So we're in Romans chapter 5. Let's turn our attention now to sanctification principles of identity. This is how, again, grace is going to bring about this change. Things that, that, that coincide with this as sanctification is spelled out in this section of Scripture. What is an identity? Well, an identity defines who you are and how you perceive yourself. And so everyone has one. We all have an identity. It's a vital function of our psychology. It defines who we are. To help understand it better, consider this description of identity that I found, in this case, how it applies to a product brand. This was a, regarding a business type website. And they're talking about a product, your brand. It says identity is the visual and verbal expression of a brand. And identity supports, expresses, communicates, synthesizes, and visualizes your brand. It is a distinctive professional image that represents your business. And just, I just thought, what if we just uh, changed a few words that, and see if this doesn't express what a true identity is with the human. We could say identity is the visual and verbal expression of who you are. And identity supports, expresses, communicates, synthesizes, and visualizes who you are. It is a distinctive personal image that represents who you are. That's what an identity is. So like a brand has an identity, it's important to the owner, so do you and I as human beings. We have an identity, it's important to us. You may be a Ford or a GM or even a Mopar, right? But we all have some identity, how we want to be seen. It's expressed outwardly often in our, how we wear our hair and the clothes we, we wear and the things we invest with our money and so forth, often tagged to our identity. And then the next point to remember, one's actions are closely related to one's identity. As the identity defines you, so also it'll take a lead in your behavior. Your actions will closely correspond to your identity. Imagine a child who's on a playground tonight, who's out in the outside, and he sees himself as the center of the world. Can't hardly imagine that, can you? But just really stretch. He has a high view of himself. Perhaps he's really spoiled. He's hardly ever been disciplined. What kind of actions could you predict coming from that child? 
And if we took a poll and you all wrote things down, I bet it would be very similar. Do you think? Things we would predict this child and how he would see things and what he would do or she would do. Imagine another child on that playground, this time one who's physically and verbally abused at home and is told that they're an unworthy child who never does anything right. What kind of actions would you expect from that child if you were to watch during the break of a playground? You see, identity, how they see themselves, weighs large in how you behave. In God's eyes, as we're going to see in Romans 5 now, there are only two possible identities for you to have. That's right, only two. Your first identity, your natural born identity is called in Adam. You, are, you started life being in Adam. You are an Adamite. This is your identity. You see, you were created in the image and likeness of God as a human being, Genesis 1, we won't turn there, but it talks about how humans were created in the image and likeness of God unlike any other created entity on earth, but you and I have fallen into the image and likeness of Adam. As Genesis 5 tells us that we are now in the image of Adam. And so we had this glorious and grand start, but there's been an awful reality that has permeated it as we are now in Adam. This creates the strange paradox of man. From a distance, humanity and mankind can look so impressive. From a distance, we can accomplish amazing things. From a distance, look at some of these buildings that we have, or cities that man has built. Incredible architecture, majestic cities, nice stadiums, impressive skylines, highways, airports, and so forth. And we look from a distance and we see man collectively expressing, even creating things that are beautiful, things that are, again, amazing. As man uses his intellect and his skills, his discovery skills, his creativity skills, and we build amazing structures. But if we get closer, if we move in closer to home to man, we see something much different. We see all around the world that there is war and there is terror and there is abuse, and there is violence, and there is human suffering. There is slavery or child labor. There's racism, poverty. There's grief. It's all emanating from a fallen world. And just like those pictures are pictures of humanity, a paradox from one extreme to the other, they're a picture of our human heart, aren't they? They're a picture of your life. There are times in your life where you've thought or done things and you would coil and, and whore if anyone knew that. Is this really me? Did I really think that? Is this really what I am do about? You see, it is really obvious. Even every religion in the world agrees. There is something wrong with us. So don't look away. Don't tune this out. You and I are both, we are, we, we are of both of these extremes. We're all bundled up into one, a <clears throat> living, breathing mass of inconsistency. We have intelligence, creativity, wisdom, laughter. We crave for what is good often in one side, and yet there's selfishness and vile passions and, and resentfulness and hatreds and everything else on the other side. And the problem is that in Adam, on your notes it says all die. In Adam, all die die. You see, death, as the Bible describes it, is separation. It is a separation from a perfect, right, holy God who has no sin and all of us that have sinned. And so this is the biblical definition or explanation, I should say, of why we die. You see, there's a, a, a universal death rate, one for one. We've never escaped it. And though science seeks to show us and philosophy seeks to rationalize and tell us about the process of death, or other things about death. There is no answer, why do we die? Ask people that, why do we die? And it's only in your Bible you're gonna see that answer. It's in the Bible we see that in death, Adam and Eve, re, excuse me, Adam and Eve chose in rebellion to go against God and to sin. That this sinful heart is a, is a heart that says no to the, uh, to the sovereign authority that is over us. And that sovereign authority, that God cannot 
put his arms around and have fellowship and intimacy with that which is sinful. This means there's a natural barrier and a death. This is the human reality. So this is our natural identity. In Romans 5, the, the idea is that every human being starts out in Adam, and in Adam all die. This is why you and I will one day physically die. Because we are what? In Adam. Is it because you sin more than someone else? No. Physical death comes by being in Adam. But if you've been born again, if you've placed your faith in Christ, you have a new identity called in Christ. In Christ you will have life, eternal life, even abundant and sanctified life on earth. God looks upon six and a half, seven billion people on the earth today, and he sees only two identities. All are rolled up into one or the other. You sitting here are either in Adam or you are in Christ. You are either dead and on your way to eternal separation from God, or you are born again through faith in Christ and you have eternal life. So look at this now in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, we read, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, thus death spread to all men, because all sin. So there's your biblical explanation. Through one man, Adam, sin enters the world. That's where death comes from. Death and separation is a result of sin. We see in verse 15, But the free gift is not like the offense, Adam's offense, for if by the one man's offense, Adam, many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. We have one man, we have the two identities. There's the man's offense and there's Jesus Christ. Verse 17, if by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. We see again. One man here, one man here. One is negative and one is positive, Adam or Christ. Verse 18, therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. Why will you receive judgment from God if you are not saved and you die? Is it your own activity and sinfulness? The answer here is no, it's through one man's offense. Whose offense? Through Adam's offense and your connection to being in Adam. That brings judgment. Just like that, verse 18, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift comes to all men, resulting in justification. Whose righteous acts? Yours? No, Christ's. And through his righteous act and your identification with his act, righteousness comes to all. So verse 19 says, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. So here you see the connection. You're either in Adam or you are in Christ. There's the only two options. And so which one are you connected with here tonight? But remember, in Adam all die, but in Christ all are made alive. In Christ all are made alive. You see, with God, identity is connected to your birth. Identity is related to birth. You're either connected with Adam or you're connected with Christ. You either have life or you have death. Now, as we think about this importance of identity as Romans 5 is setting forth, we also want to note this. In order to change what you do, you have to change who you are. In order to change what you do, you have to change who you are. If you want change in your life, if you want change in your behavior and your activity, the Bible's going to say it's going to have to start with a change in your identity. Failing to grasp this will lead you to try and change what you do, to try to change others, to try to change your circumstances. But the first and important change that's needed is to go from being an Adam to becoming one who is in Christ and having new life and new identity. Who you are provides a basis for what you do. A principle would be doing stems from being, and there's a connection, as we had said. And then remember, before we go on, that Satan is in the business of identity theft. Satan wants to miss you for, for you to misidentify yourself. He wants you to lose sight of who you are in Christ. 
You are not your job. You're not how much money you have in the bank. You are not the car you drive. You are not the contents of your wallet. You are not the color or condition of your hair or the clothes that you have on your back. You're not the substance that you're addicted to. You're not the weakness that you bear. You're not the failure that follows you, and you're not the problem that grips you. You're not the bike that you ride or the ball that you bounce or the jersey that you slip on. You are not the success that you might enjoy in the world. You, if you're saved, are a born-again child of God, and you've taken the name Christian, and you are not what you do. You are who you are by birth in Christ. You are what God says you are. You are his and you are in him and you are loved and you are forgiven. And he is in you and he is for you. And this is who you are. And you might struggle and you might fail. You might even be arrogant or misguided or distracted. You might be a, a drunk or a slut or a glutton or a successful career person, wealthy, admired, whatever, either extreme. That is not who you are. If you're saved, you are a Christ one, period. A Christ one who may have a drinking problem, or who may have an eating disorder, or who may be arrogant, but you're a Christ one. You're Jesus Christ. You're a child of, excuse me, you're a child of God in Jesus Christ. Remember that. Satan always wants you to focus on what you do. God wants you to focus on who you are as he has defined it. Verse 20, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Remember that where there is sin, there is always more grace. That's right. Grace is radical and truly amazing. You can sleep well tonight in the knowledge that you're forgiven, declared righteous, and loved. And there is nothing you can do about it. So we've seen what sanctification is. We've seen how it's related to God's love and his grace as we respond to that. We've seen we have a natural first birth identity in Adam. That is very problematic. But through faith in Christ, we receive a new birth and a new identity, and we then realize life changes, uh, life changes come from recognizing that new identity. To see then how this identity is played out practically, we move to the next section in Romans 6 where we see Understanding this identity means that we understand a position we have as well. Romans 6 1 says, Shall we just continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer is, No, you should not. The paraphrase of the question is, Shall, shall we just continue on in life unchanged? Shall we just continue non sanctified, not changed in our life? And the answer is, No. The objection is raised because of 520, the claim that. You cannot out -sin the grace of God. Well, Romans 6.2 gives us the answer then. The answer is no. And then he says, verse 3, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? I'm sorry, verse 2, he says, Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer therein? You see, when you see the term sin in Romans 5.20 all the way through 6.13, in the Greek it's a singular noun, and it has the definite article the in front of it. So we read it as the sin, the sin. And this is important as we understand our passage as we keep going. It's singular. It's not sins, plural, or collectively. It's a noun not indicating action, sinning. And it has the in front of it. And the, what it is in front of is even personified from time to time. As a reigning king in Romans 5.21 Something that can have slaves in Romans 6.6. 6. So the literal understanding for the noun sin in this passage would be the sin nature. The sin nature. Everyone, every one of us, has a sin nature. In fact, every one of you, here's what I'd like you to do. Get to the front of your handout, right side up, not on the left side, on the right side. Not in cursive. I want you to write your name down in all caps. I'm surprised I'm hearing that much paper shuffling. Because I know what you're thinking. If only we could hear your thoughts right now. No way. Why are you telling me to do that? Oh, okay, I'll do it, but I'm going to put it on the right side. Right? I mean, if you thought I was serious, I said, open up, put your name down. You thought I was serious? There's something in you that would say, 
What? Would you agree? What? Who do you think you are? And you might do it in compliance, but inside you're going, this is stupid. <laughs> or, like many of you, you're not going to do it at all. And that is a pure identification of what? The sin nature within you. The sin nature that doesn't like to be told what to do. The sin nature that prefers independence. The sin nature that wants to do what it wants to do when it wants to do it. And that's how all of us live life. In fact, without discipline in life, without correction in life, we're going to be a sin nature a steam wreck or a train wreck. That's why people are the most miserable, often are the ones that have had the least, uh, least uh, uh, habit of ever saying no to the sin nature. So it's in every one of us. It comes from being born in Adam. And in Adam, remember, there is a, it has a legitimate authority in life. Romans 5, notice verse 21, so that as the sin nature reigned in death, the sin nature reigns where? In death. What happens to all who are in Adam? In Adam all die. Where does the sin nature reign? In, in the realm of Adam. If you're in Adam, the sin nature is your boss. You can do nothing about it. It's like this. You're an army soldier. You go to the, you're, you're enlisted. You've signed on the line, and you're in the war. You're a soldier. As a soldier, you're going to live a soldier kind of life. You're going to have a soldier kind of identity. You're going to value things that soldiers value. Correct? And you have a drill sergeant who likes to just whisper sweet nothings to you <laughs> and likes to just suggest things for you, right, as you stand out in the rain, is only interested in your best. No, the sin nature, the soul, excuse me, the drill sergeant is very demanding, and you must submit. If you are in Adam, you have a nature within you that is like this drill sergeant, and it reigns in the realm of death if you're not saved. But if you're saved and you're, as we will look at later, if you're carnal, it's the same thing. You're still submitting to this authority within you, or you, you think it is. So, the answer to the objection that Paul gives in Romans 6, 2, is that you have died to your sin nature. No, you should not continue to live life unchanged. Because don't you know that you have died to the sin nature and you don't have to live any longer in it? So this is the explanation that is given. And we need a little more for that to make sense. And thankfully, Paul goes on and gives us much more. Starting in verse 3, he says, Don't you know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? So we note now that every believer in Christ was baptized into Christ, was baptized into him, meaning they were placed into him, and by implication they are now identified with him. Don't you know this, believer? Don't you know you were placed into Christ, and you're now identified with him. This is what we call in Christ truth, also known as position truth. And Peter brought this out a number of times this morning in Colossians 2, and Dave brought this out in Romans 6 as well. So we have seen this, and you have heard this many times, but this is a truth we cannot overemphasize that we are in Christ. We have been placed into Christ and identified into him. A common New Testament theme. And this was done by the Holy Spirit. When you got saved, you were baptized, you were placed into Christ's death and burial, as verse 4 says. So you were buried with him through baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead, so then you'll have life with him. The day you got saved, there was a death and a funeral notice in heaven for you. If you could go to heaven, look at the Jerusalem Star. What a newspaper, huh? You're reading the Jerusalem Star, and you'll see that there are some funeral notices. We'll just pick on the three of us here, right? And, and on the day that you got saved, you died. A legal death with a death notice that was put up. And so, it's an official recognition, and that's what he's saying here in verses 4. We were... We were bat verse 3, we were baptized into Christ, baptized into his death, and we were buried with him. So you were placed into Christ, and when Christ was on the cross, you were co-crucified with him. When Christ was buried, you were co-buried with him. And so you have a co-crucifixion and a co-burial. When you got saved, you then were given this new birth and this new identity. Because coming from this, verse 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. We walk in newness of life, which means you're no longer dead, you're what? Alive. 
You had a birth that occurred. You walk in newness of life, necessitates life. You got that life the moment you were saved. You were then born again. So when you got saved, there was this official death on the one hand, and then there's an official birth in the other. We go back to the Jerusalem star, and oddly enough, on the same day, there's birth announcement. That's not a very good picture. I was even cuter than that as a baby. There's a birth announcement. One section of the paper tells of my death. The other section tells of my birth. And there was one for Scott, already a hunter. And there's one for pastor. <laughs> and so the significance of this, the significance of this is to show there was a legal death and a total new birth. And with that new birth, there's what? A new identity. A new identity. And so you are a new person with a new identity, and you are in Christ. Are you an Adam? No. That was crucified. Your old man, who you were in Adam, was crucified. And so that's why we go now to Romans 6.6 6 that says, knowing this, our old man was crucified with him. Who's the old man? The old man is not your sin nature. The old man is what you were in Adam. It's your unregenerate, unsaved self. There you are. You're in Adam. And the Bible says when Jesus Christ was crucified, when you placed your faith in Christ, you were co-crucified with him. So what you were in Adam, the old man, died. And that's a legal death, as we've said. So your old man is now dead, and you are a new birth, a new person, and a new identity in Christ. And we're to know this, and we're to walk by faith. Which means the cross and the resurrection of Christ are central to justification, but they're also central to what? Sanctification as the basis of your Christian life is recognizing your co-crucifixion, co-burial, and then your new life that you now walk in newness of. In Christ, all shall be made alive. In Adam, all what? Die. Did you die then? Yes, you died when you got saved in, in, in Adam, or excuse me, with Christ, as what you were in Adam then was crucified. So we see then, it is not enough to change what you do, remember? You have to change who you are. Does God take care of that? He does. And God takes care of that as you place your faith in Christ and begin to step out by faith. It's not our works, again. It's all by grace. It's by faith. This, then, is your old man, which was what you were in Adam. It was crucified with Christ. So we are to know this, Romans 6.6. 6. Who we were in Adam was crucified. But if we go on in verse 6, Knowing this, he goes on, that the body of sin might be done away. So this in turn renders your sin nature powerless because of your death. Should be an R there, because of your death. In other words, because of your identification with Christ on the cross and the old man being crucified, the authority that the sin nature has is in the realm of in Adam. The sin nature is free to be boss. Where? In Adam. Are you in Adam anymore? No, you're in Christ. Can the sin nature be your boss? Not legally, not with any officialness, for not as God sees it. You have been brought out, you are a new identity, and the sin nature's power as it wants to dominate your life and use your body, as really literally we would understand this as the, the sin nature, the sin-dominated body was rendered powerless. The word rendered powerless, uh, the Greek word there means to be, again, to be rendered or stripped of its power. So the sin nature is still there, because you're still in your physical body. It still wants to reign and dominate, but it has no more authority to do it. The result of this is that you have been forever freed from the power of the sin nature. You no longer have to act as if you are a slave to it. That's the end of verse 6, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. We should no longer be a slave to the sin nature. That's a fact. Verse 7 says, he who has died has been freed from sin. Have you died? Yes, your old man was crucified with Christ. Yes, there was a death. Then what does that mean, verse 7? You have been freed from the, any power or authority of sin to dominate your life. And that's what we're to know. Using that drill sergeant again, your time is done, your tour of duty is over, you're no longer a soldier, you're a civilian. You're now living in a civilian status with civilian clothes that display your new identity. You do civilian kind of things. 
Like, don't make your bed, for one, right? You live like a civilian. You think like a civilian. And then you see your old drill sergeant at Walmart while shopping. He's still alive. He's there. And he says, drop, maggot. Give me 50 push-ups right here. And he barks orders at you. Do you do it? Answer? No. Why? Because you're not a soldier. Who are you? You're a civilian. And I don't have to listen to the demands of the drill sergeant because I'm no longer in the same relationship with him. The relationship has been forever changed. And if you started to do it, if you're with someone, let's say, and, and they're starting to do push-ups and you're their friend, what would you say? What would you say? Get up. What are you doing? Don't you know you're a civilian? Right? You would appeal. This doesn't make sense, friend. You have a new identity. You're a civilian. Well, Romans 6.6 6 then reminds us the sin nature's power has been done away. And the reason for it is that you no longer, the sin nature can no longer dominate your physical body, dominate your life with the effects of sin carried out. You have a changed relationship. And the result of this is you've been forever freed from the power of the sin nature. And you do not have to be a slave to it. That brings us to Romans chapter 6, 11 through 13. After explaining these truths, we read, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to the sin nature, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice why. Where are you? You are where? You are in Christ. So we finally see a command given. There hasn't been a command in all of Romans up to now. And now practically given, here's the command. Reckon yourself to be dead to the sin nature but alive to God. Reckon is a word of think, add up the facts, and remember this. Remember, you don't have to do push-ups at Walmart. Remember, you're no longer a soldier. You're a civilian. And reckon yourself to be dead to the sin nature but alive to God. The second command, choose not to let the sin nature dominate your physical body. But notice the very interesting connection between 11 and 12. Verse 11, he says, likewise, now you reckon and think this way. And then verse 12 says, therefore, which means verse 12 assumes verse 11 has occurred, which means if you don't do verse 11 in your thinking and reckon this to be true, you will not be able to move on into verse 12 where he says, based on what God says is true, don't let the sin nature reign in your body. Don't let the sin nature have sway of your physical body. You have that choice as you have successfully reckoned yourself dead to the sin nature. And then instead of giving your physical body over to the control of the sin nature, put your body at the disposal of God. Present your body. Allow God to have his say. That's the question. That's the answer to the question in verse 1. Should we continue in sin? No 12-step program? No threats? No hanging you over to hell? No, you might lose your salvation? Paul doesn't reason that way. He simply says, know who you are. No, he's saying this. Can you follow this through? No, you should not continue to live your life unchanged because you have a new identity and a new position in Christ. You are co-crucified and co-buried, so you're no longer in Adam. You're now in a new realm. You are in Christ. The sin nature only has legitimately reigning in Adam, and you're not in Adam. So reckon yourself dead to the sin nature because of your death with Christ. Choose by faith to not let the sin nature reign. It has no authority to do so. And now place your body at the disposal of God for his righteousness. These are the practical commands, the only ones in the entire passage and the only ones in Romans up to this point. Reckon, choose not to yield, present yourself to God. That's the path to change. But this is just positive thinking, isn't it? Isn't this just modern psycho psychology? Look in the mirror, I love myself. Other people love me, I'm, right? No, this is not positive thinking. This is positive thinking. You're all on a plane in a field and kicking a soccer ball around, and you think you're the next, you know, this is how much little I know about soccer. You're the next Pele. He played soccer, right? You're the next star, and you're kicking the final, the winning goal at the World Cup, and the crowd goes crazy. All this is going on in your thinking. Or instead of that, maybe you're, you're the rink rat out on the rink and you're shooty, shoots, he scores, he wins the Stanley Cup. You see, that's positive thinking. 
Why? Because it's not based on reality. It is very, very, very likely neither of these people or kids will ever be what they think they're going to be in their moment of their Right? But is that what the scriptures are? Wait, God is telling you here tonight, friends, is this is who you are and this is what is true. This is not positive thinking. This is reality. This is exactly what God says. This is the timeless, absolute word of God, spiritual reality the way it is. You, have been, you are dead in Adam and alive in Christ. It's time to settle your thoughts and minds on the more sure word of God. Well, that brings us to our last section, Romans chapter 7 and 8. And we're going to just see that the power for change and the ability to live right does not come by keeping the law in Romans 7. Okay? And we're going to skip the next two. You're going to go to the next one. It says the power for change and ability to live right does not come by self-effort. So if you were to read Romans 7, we're going to skip it all tonight because time has left us. But you're going to see that Paul is saying you cannot make changes by living according to the law or keeping the law, and you cannot live right through your own self-effort. And so Paul brings this out in Romans 7 and saying that these are insufficient power sources because it's, it's someone who is in Christ but trying to rely on principles that relate to being in Adam. Okay, because Adam tends to think, and Adam is always a performance basis and a pecking order and this kind of thinking. And when you're in Christ, that doesn't fly. You are a, a child of God. And you do have acceptance. You have status. And it's not based on your performance. And so the Spirit of God wants to move you away from performance thinking. Dave touched on that this afternoon. And so there's going to be seen then as just one condition for us to live the Christian life. Although you may have good intentions and right desires, you cannot empower them, as Romans 7 would say, and it's because there's a law of sin and death that's successfully overwhelming the self-reliant believer. Just know from Romans 7, Paul says, the more you try to do right, the more you're going to fail because you don't have the ability. Okay, so I know I'm going to go fast, but I, don't, I, don't, I want to just move on up to here, so we're going to skip all that. Sorry, we'll figure all that out later. All right, so... <laughs> We're going to look at the next point. This means that God will fulfill in you the righteous requirement of the law. We jump into chapter 8 where I want to uh, just say a few things and then we'll try to we'll wrap it up. Romans 8 verse 1, there, There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death, verse 2. Verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin, the sin nature in the flesh. Now notice verse 4, all of this so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Verse 4 is a staggering verse. Don't let it escape you. Verse 4 says everything the spirit of God and God wants to accomplish, every change you have ever hoped for or wished, all of that will occur in you by God as you walk according to the power of the spirit. God will fulfill in you the righteous requirement of the law. I mean, that, that's an, a staggering statement if you really think about it. God will produce and bring about this change in you. But you must not rely on yourself, self-reliant morality, and you must not rely on the law, and it has a lot to do with recognizing who you are and remembering your proper identity. So the one right source of change, is gonna, as we will have seen, is going to be... Um, the Spirit of God. Um, the wrong sources we saw were, the, were, were self-reliance and, and trying to do it your own, yourself. But as we now find the one right source is the Spirit of God, we see two words, fulfilled, which means to bring to a designed end, and in you, the sphere where this occurs. The designed end of the law is the righteous requirement being fulfilled in you. This is what God's will is for you. This is what our heart uh, desires when, when we are walking with the Lord. We want to be pleasing to the Lord. We want to uh, see the righteous requirement of the law work through us. And God says, I will do that. But it's not done by you. It's done by him. And the sphere is in you. This is where this successful activity takes place. Philippians 2.13 reminds us of that. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as much in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, 
Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But then he goes on to say, it's God who does this in you. God produces in you the will to do and the desire of his good pleasure. So this is God who's working in you. It's God the Holy Spirit that's producing this. It's God alone who has the power and the ability. And the only condition for you is to walk according to the Spirit. To walk according to the Spirit has much to do with your mind is set on the very things that God's Word puts forth. Your mind is set on the things of Christ, the things of God's love, the things of God's grace. And as your eyes are on Christ and you're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, with your mind set upon those things, the Spirit is free to work and to bring and effect change in our life. And so that is how God will do it. So I'm going to skip ahead here. Sorry, we're just going to go on to the, the grace sanctification. If we understand it right, we see that there's three pillars here. God wants you to understand your identity. God wants you to understand your position. God wants you to understand where the power, the ability comes from. And when you are walking by faith, recognizing these things, God says the righteousness of the law is produced in you as you walk according to the Spirit. And so these are the final, the two passages to just to focus on tonight. is Romans 6, 11 through 13, where God is presenting here in this passage the, um, uh, the imperatives or the commands there, the way of thinking for us, what he wants us to do is to set our mind, reckon on these spiritual truths, and then allow ourselves to walk out by faith in light of them. And as we do that, the Spirit of God is free to work and bring about change. What kind of change? The second great passage, Romans 8, 4. Just meditate on that. It's a beautiful passage. That God will actually bring about the righteous requirement of the law practically in our life as we learn to cooperate and walk by faith in him. So now, we'll close with one last illustration. What is that? What does, a cow, what does a cow say? Can you all humor me? I just want to hear a lot. Very good. A cow says moo. Okay? Very good. What is that? It's very good. What does a dog say? Okay? And I'll bark. Okay? <laughs> What's that? This is, a, this is a dog that thinks he's a cow. Now, let's use this as an illustration. The dog is your proper identity. You should be a, your identity is you're a dog, and you are a Christ one. So you are a dog because you're in Christ, right? But Satan has performed an identity theft here, and even though you are a dog, you think you're a cow, and will think all this stuff about mooing is bad. It's like sin. So the average pulpit, the average church, all the world over will say, here's what you do. You should not be mooing. Mooing is wrong. Mooing is bad. Bad dog. <laughs> and we have laws against mooing. Thou shalt not moo. Thou shouldest bark. And let's get these laws up in a frame and let's put them on a wall in your room. Or let's frame these laws up and get them in your schools or in the lounge at the town hall. And let's focus on these laws and let's learn them and let's fight and fight your mooing. And stop mooing and fight it until you win. Learn these laws. Stop mooing and give us more money. <laughs> or they'll say, listen, mooing is bad. God does not like mooing. You should stop mooing. Roll up your sleeves. Try harder. Move your lips. Open your mouth. Here, push some. I'm trying to teach you how to bark. And they'll tell you it's serious if you moo too much. It's just going to prove that you never really were a dog. <laughs> or, if, or if you moo too much, Jesus will, will, will punish you severely and, and throw you into the, the dog house for a thousand years. <laughs> Bad dog. <laughs> now, I know it's amusing, but realize this happens. Obviously, that's exaggerated, but this happens way too often. And Satan is the only one who's pleased with that. So instead, in closing, let's just get it right. If you want the dog to stop mooing, 
you take him to the word of God, you show him God's love and God's grace, you show him the meaning of the cross, you show him his salvation, you show him grace again and you teach him. And what do you teach him? Grace is teaching him. And you teach him his identity. You teach him he's a born again, in this case, dog, in Christ. He has a new identity. And grace will teach him what dogs are like and what dogs will do. And they'll start to bark on their own, without threats, without gimmicks, because they're responding to Christ and they're responding to who they are in him. The dog sees he's a dog, and the Lord brings the change. And that's what we hope you see tonight. That's grace sanctification, as God wants us to see who we are, and as we just relax in that and trust him through the Spirit of God, he produces the Christian life. Let's pray. Father.